Okay, seems good. All right, started, started, started. Hello there. Hi. Um, grab that bottle of water. And today we're going to talk about cartoon game art. Oh, I shouldn't have the stream open right there. There we go. Um, can I have the chat somewhere? Okay. No, yes, no, no, yes. Please open the chat. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining uh, the stream today. And we're going to make game assets with a cartoon or cell shaded style in Krita. As far as the tools are concerned, it's quite basic. There's not so much to say about it. That is to say, we're going to use a simple brushes. So there are a few you can use. Um, brushes like this one, the shape brush to create the silhouette of the character or the shadows. I'll show you how. And then sharp brushes like these. And there's something special about this stream. Um, it's based on a project I had for a long time that I just got the opportunity to get started. And we're going to use the uh, universe made by David Revoir called Pepper and Carrot. And this is an open source um, webcomic. So let me grab the link. For all those who don't know it, uh, basically, David is on Patreon and he makes this webcomic for free. There are plenty of translations, lots of, you know, people contributing and it's uh, beautiful. So he's had a lot of experience with open source programs. He works with uh, Krita, Inkscape, Gimp and uh, Blender, things like these. Uh, but on top of that, he's been the art director on several short films for the Blender Foundation, uh, Sintel, if you've seen it. And so uh, the comic is about Pepper and uh, Carrot. So Pepper is the uh, young witch and Carrot is her cat. And they basically, um, you know, go through funny adventures and all and, you know, make potions. I mean, it's you have to look at the webcomic because these stories are, you know, every story is different. Um, but yeah, it's a cute universe. And it's interesting to have an existing art direction like this to create a game uh, from there. So let me grab... Can you hear the music, by the way? Is the, the sound okay? Uh, let me grab that. Three. Okay. And yeah, so here's my interpretation of the character which is quite different from the original. Uh, the cat is, you know, Carrot is really round and um, mischievous. And I wanted to make him look a little more serious for a small game project. I started in 2016. Um, let me see, what do I have here? I should have the, no, I only have the pictures from it. Yeah, so it's a small go-to game. Um, I'm looking for the sprites. I forgot the to, to grab the file before the stream. Um, come on. All right, so here are the characters. Basically, in that little game, Carrot found, you know, the um, magic wand from Pepper and just grabbed it and uses it to throw spells on dummies and, you know, in a, in a simple arcade game. And nope, I won't be speaking French because uh, there's the question in the chat. Because uh, everyone else speaks English pretty much here. That's it. I can do a French accent in English if you want. So, so yeah, let's get started. And uh, sorry if I sound a bit tired. Uh, I guess I do because I am. Um, but I'll do my best to still make the stream enjoyable for you. So the principle is the same as usual when building game assets. Um, we have to start with the shape and we're going to use several brushes for that purpose. So let me build the shape of the body real quick. Uh, so that way I can get started showing you the shading and all. 
So how are you doing, by the way? I don't see uh My voice only comes from the left speaker. Uh-huh. Maybe um uh, I I think I know why. It's because um I have a stereo microphone and um hold on, give me a sec. Trying to fix that. Okay, microphone, uh, do, can I, how can I fix that? I can't fix it right there, let me see. Nope, I don't have anything in there, in the tool set. Oh, come on. There you go, mono. Okay, so I have to restart the program to fix that. So give me a second, the, the stream is going to cut and I'll be right back. Okay, let me see, I should be back. Is it good? All right, sorry for that, sorry for the cut. So that should be fixed, please tell me uh, if that's okay. And for the brushes, uh, I'll just grab the link real quick. There you go, There's, uh, the, the free version is there. Okay, so let me continue with that. If you have any questions, as usual, I'll do my best to read the chat as we go. Um, so the start is always the same. I'm drawing the character's outlines and um, I'm treating it as a static asset. So for the body, I'm using a very simple approach where I just Draw the contour and fill it then. Uh, you hear me twice? Echo in the background. Okay. Can you tell me if this... Oh, uh, I think I see. Maybe that's it? Uh, is it better now? Just tell me if it... This shouldn't have anything to do with the desktop audio. Maybe that's it. Uh, is it better now? Uh, I don't know why. Just tell me if it, this shouldn't have anything to do with the desktop audio. It's fixed. Can you tell me if it's still fixed now? Because um, I want to know if it's linked to the desktop audio channel or if it was just like the webcam picking up the the signal. Okay, thanks guys. Glad to know it's fixed. Yeah, I've had to... I was working before the stream um, and I, w I rushed this character a little bit and, you know, uh, so that's why I, um, I prepared the, um, everything normally, but um, I missed some parts today. Me fix the tail and then we're ready to go oh yes so I have a copy of the original character and today we're going to make a cell shaded version uh, when I turn on the music it comes back okay so I'll turn the music off sorry for that uh, this happened on the last stream as well I, I'd like to I wonder why that is but um, yeah I'll let you put your own music in the background Okay. And now we have the base character. We can get started. Okay. So the principle with cell shading, let me uh, grab um, some pictures on Pinterest, maybe. Pinterest is a great place for uh, reference, including for game art. Ah, oh, come on. Yes. Okay, sorry, not safe for work or some part, but so let's go with cell shading. Just so you understand what we're going to do. Um, this is not exactly shaded. Um, maybe you could search for anime, I guess. That's the a typical style you find in cartoons and animation um, where 
you only have a few levels of you know shadows you you have a sharp separation between the shadow area and the highlight areas basically so the principle is you take soft shadows from the real world and yeah i'm taking you know i'm taking questions as we go so don't hesitate um to to ask them i check the chat from time to time so yeah um the idea is that you you take soft shadow from from the real world so say this character has a very round face for example if i grab an airbrush i'll take a darker tone and um you know so i can draw a soft shadow like that and tighten it as i go um that's typically how you would establish the base shadows for characters okay the principle when you're doing cell shading is just to do this it's just to have you know a threshold basically um below which you just have shadow and above which you just have your highlight tone okay so i'll start with a slightly less saturated base tone there you go so that's that's how you do it in a sense that's how you try to think about it um and it's not always that easy it's not always that easy um so the the way i recommend you tackle that is just define the shadow area like you have to think about the character's form and where the light is coming from. Obviously, it's very important to know, you know your light direction, to have it in mind at all times. Um, let's say, basically, the idea is the light is coming from the top, maybe slightly from the left, as usual, in games. And so... Let's get started. Um, I'm going to design, to define, sorry, the shadow area with a line. That's something I like to do. So everything below that line is going to be shadow, okay, on the face. And as we'll add the eyes later on, you know, they'll, they'll fill up some space as well. Uh, the character might look a bit funny until then, but, you know, eventually all will be fine. Okay, so when you define a shadow area like that with a line, when you use um, a tool like the magic wand, I'm going to hide the body, mate. You can use a tool like the magic wand and just fill everything, you know, um, but not limiting the selection to the current layer. So you just want to select based on everything that's on the screen, and then you will just the selection and you kind of get your shadow the result might be a bit sloppy but i guess you know you get the idea and um, i invite you to clean up with the eraser afterwards works pretty well it's very important to have uh, the shadow on a separate layer like i'm doing right now so that you can change the color later there are two ways to add the shadows on you know when you're doing that uh, game art style one way is what I'm doing now. You're working with 100% um, opacity, you know, normal mode colors. So you just pick the shadow colors individually. And in general, to pick them, you pick your base color. And then you might want to do a bit of hue shifting. So you, you move the hue slider um, in one direction. So basically when you have warm tones, it's interesting to move them towards purple. It works fairly well. Blues go work well when you move them towards purple as the colors get darker. Um, and then for greens, it depends on the situation. It's a bit more complex. Sometimes you have to go towards grays instead or uh, go towards warm or cool colors depending on the situation. Okay, that's one way to do it. The other way is you then... Um, instead of having the layer in normal mode, you're going to pick a very desaturated color and a single color for the entire character, like that. So I'll put it out of the group. 
and set the layer to multiply. It's very common in illustration. Um, let me group the entire character, otherwise this is not going to work. There you go. And you just have to find one color that works well with the character. So the saturation may vary depending on the, the project and the lightness more importantly, you know, you want to play with that a little bit. But start with a dark tone, just so you see if the color is adding dirt to the character or if it's, you know, going in the right direction. For example, here, you know, it's adding warmth. I can see that. So I can pull the lightness back up and have just that fairly subtle shadow. And there you go. And the advantage of this method is that you have a single shadow layer at the top of your layer stack. So this works if your character is, you know, a static asset for backgrounds and all. Uh, if you have to make all the body parts separate, you can't use that. And that's why you would make one group for each body part. I personally prefer to choose to tones like these in normal mode, uh, simply because I have full control over the saturation and all. And yes, uh, every video, every stream is available uh, afterwards, you know, so you don't have to worry about that. You can watch it later, you can watch it, you know, in faster mode. Um, one tip, in Krita there's something that's really cool. With control click, you can pick a color on the screen, okay? Uh, the color as you see it. But if you control alt click, you're going to pick a color only on the layer. And for example, this layer is in multiply mode. So if I were to pick the color on the screen and paint with it, you know, it, it would give me a different result. But if I control alt click, I get to pick the color I want to use, you know, my shadow tone. And while I'm at it, um, you know, because there's only so much to say about what we're doing now, about the, the types of sprites, I'm going to talk about shadows and all. Uh, but, you know, I'm looking to post more videos on the channel again. I've just got some client work going on and um, I'm preparing a new Kickstarter campaign. Uh, so I'll post about that and all. But uh, that's why there's not so much activity on the channel. Just that... Um, I've really got to, you know, make some money and um, yeah, if that doesn't happen, you know, I can't keep up with the channel. So that's the priority right now and um, basically with the upcoming Kickstarter, I'm going to do a lot of free tutorials. That's the, that's the goal at least. So yeah, you'll see that pretty soon, I'll announce it and I'll include it on the channel. But coming back to the character, um, you know, as far as defining the shadows is concerned, basically, I'm I'm using some tricks. You know, I I'm not that great of an artist um, myself. Like, I do have some experience working in games and all, but I'm not a you know a super knowledgeable. Um, artists who can do super realistic paintings without reference. I'm working without reference at the moment. So we use some tricks in games like the bottom of the face because the light direction is often the same. Um, you, you treat the face of the character a bit like a, a rugby ball, for example, in here. And you know that this part is facing down. So because the light is coming from the top, this area will be shadow. And you try to treat every body part like that. Like I'm not thinking about what I mean by um, um, not doing a great job as an artist. You know, I'm not thinking about the anatomy and great details and all, because uh, that would take some reference. But, um, um, how can I say? Yeah, you know, it, it's still somewhat accurate if you treat every body part as a simpler form, as a simpler shape. Okay, so with this approach, with the shadow layer at the top, it's quite convenient. You can see how quickly we're able to add shadows to the, the character. I'm going to add some drop shadow from the head to the body. 
and then continue from there. So same trick as before. It just, you know, draws some line. And it, it can be quite sloppy or I'm going to um, toggle. I'm using a program called Lazy Nezumi for, you know, the uh, line smoothing. So there's, a, there's uh, the algorithm built in Krita, you know, but I like to use this one because it has, uh, it has something I want to show you. It's when I'm doing um, lines like that and I want the, the line to finish on every stroke, you know, I have a very huge amount of smoothing and it has some angular momentum, which Krita doesn't have, sadly. And the stabilizer, I really liked Krita stabilizer, but in the latest versions, it's, um, it doesn't feel as good as before for some reason. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to some, some more updates in that regard. I don't know if that's going to happen. Yeah, Lazy Nezumi is, is really cool. Um, it's it's really powerful. So basically, La Krita does a lot of things that Lazy Nezumi does. And Lazy Nezumi is a paid program, okay? Um, but because it's a specialized program, it does a lot of things, you know, um, how can I say? Um, like the, the guy who makes that is making it full time. So he, he really has the time to focus on the algorithms and, you know, making things feel as good as possible. So if you, you know, if you can afford it, I think it's $40 or something and uh, maybe $40 a year, something like that. You know, but if you can afford it, it's, it's worth it, I think. I bought my license a, a long time ago, basically when it was just released. So uh, it's especially worth it for me, right? Let me see. Let me grab the face. We just have the expression there. And there we go. So we have the base of our character. Yep, I just, um, the, the brush preset icons are a, a bit weird, but uh, I just made this brush generator basically to so I can uh, focus on creating brushes instead of making thumbnails because they take a ton of time to, to create. They take more time to create than the um, brush presets themselves, and that's a PT. So um, that's why now I have those presets that basically you sign them right there you know they uh work pretty well with the um how can i say pop up palette all right so next step uh, you need to have you know the eyes and the um stripes and all on the characters and this is going to show you why this method is, uh, is especially good so let me create just some okay eye shapes and try and work real quick with that okay the character's eyes and all the muzzle it's something a bit better than that So in a uh, pepper and carrot, the characters have, you know, a, a fairly small no nose uh, in general. It's really interesting because um, it's not, it's really this European style, but um, I like how the um, characters have, you know, are somewhat slightly, ever so slightly inspired from mangas, I think. When you look at uh, Pepper, for, for example, like there's some uh, slight Japanese influence. I think these characters as well, you know, they really make me um, think about the witches from the Ghibli movies. Uh, from, um, how is it called? 
Shiro's uh, Journey, I think it's in English. Something like that. All right. So yeah, the good thing with um, this method using a shadow layer is that you can add more stuff below those layers, more details, and the shadow will apply to it. Will apply to them. Maybe we don't want shadows on the eyes, right? Could be uh, that could go below the eyes. Where are you? And uh, yeah, your multiply mode layer is going to apply to the entire character. Spirited away, thank you. Yeah, so uh, the witches uh, from the Sha Shazoa witches, I don't know how it's meant to be to be called, but from uh, David's webcomic, uh, make me think about that uh, uh, boss from the Spirited Away movie. So you can see how the character is coming up. Mm. That's it, Larry said. It's, it's right, it's spirited away. I had forgotten it, but um, it's this one, yep. All right. So now with the base established, below the shadow layer, let's add some um, extra details. And for that, every time you're adding some details, you want to use the base color. Uh, of this detail, basically, because it's the multiplied layer that will take care of adding the shadows. And we can um, use other blending modes just to add the... Whoops. We can use other blending modes to add the um, highlights later on if we want to have some highlights. So, the character Pepper has some stripes. I'm going to use the... Um, the illustration as a reference, he has, uh, you know, three stripes on uh, either side and at the top of his face, and three stripes as well on the tail. Um, on top of that, there's a bit of, you know, uh, darker color I've added to the ears. These are not on the original design, but uh, I like the contrast it added you know, to the character. So let's try and add that. Okay, new layer. And I'm going to pick a darker orange. This is way too red, way too much red, way too saturated. So as this is a game character, you know, I'm starting with a not too saturated tone. Um, for me, it's important to, you know, to be able to push um, things when, you know, we're compositing the characters but uh, not to have things... Uh, basically, when you're doing digital art, with the filters, like levels and all, it's very hard to pull things back. If you have too much contrast, you won't be able to, just with a filter, get your character back on track. However, it's fairly easy to, um, you know, to push things. Um, and that's what they do. That's what you do in things like Hollywood movies, for example. Whoopsie daisies. So it's quite straightforward, as you can see, I'm just um, painting the contour of the area I want to fill, like uh, giving it some limit, basically. And then I fill the inside with the fill tool set to use all the layers in the document. And then, uh, obviously, if you if you really want your your sprite to shine, you have to um, zoom in a bit, like clean up those details. Um, but the best thing to do, and the the wisest thing to do at that stage, would be to you know ask some peers. Once you've added um, all the details, but in a more or less sloppy way, you know you don't have to um, make it too polished at first. 
and make sure with your art director or you know a senior artist in your team if you work in a team obviously uh, make sure that they take a look at it and tell you what's going wrong um, one very small thing that's more of a detail but you know going to the uh, paying special attention to the edges of your shapes and form is quite important you can see that i'm really zooming in just to erase a little bit of um, the stripe just to make it feel like it's turning around in space a bit more do you have any questions by the way I see uh, there's not so much activity in uh, the chat right now. Or oh, everyone's gone maybe and I'm alone, basically. Okay, the usual thing. And transform the stripes a little bit. With the liquify tool. Hey, these are. Ah, uh, yeah, I had a selection. <laughs> Hola, Angel. Um. Do you know how to make unified color palettes? I'm having trouble. Okay, do you want to talk a bit about color theory? Anyone? Who wants to? Tell me. We can talk about that for a moment. The, the short answer, Matthew. So Matthew is asking um, about advice to make unified colors um, and unified color palettes and the short answer is um, there's no definitive answer to that it's it mostly depends on you know your understanding of lighting and um, and how things work in the real world but I'll try to give you some tips so first of all um, there's a lot of stuff about triadic and, um, you know, monochromatic or uh, dual colors. Like there are lots of tools like, uh, let me check. I think it's called Adobe Colors. All that to show you that um, you shouldn't use it at first. So I think it's Adobe Colors. Uh, Adobe Cooler, okay. So here we are looking at some generated, you know, rule-based color palette, uh, palettes of five colors. And the idea is that, you know, there are some mathematic rules you can use to get color palettes that work well with colors that are, for example, in that case, complementary. Okay, so um, I've talked a bit about this in, in my uh, last course, like uh, Krita. The, the premium Krita course. Uh, let me try to explain that. Basically, when we're thinking in terms of contrast, it, it's one of the core principles of design. So we want to have contrast in our pieces because it helps to make certain elements pop. For example, when you take a character like this, the character is a lot darker than this white empty background. So he's visible on top of it. It would also work with a very dark background because the character is bright. So that's what we call value contrast. The character looks darker or lighter than its surroundings. Then there's color contrast. You have some yellow orange tones on the character's body. And then if you look to the left, it's subtle, but you have some blue. That's a complementary color palette, okay? Just so you know, this is complementary but mathematical and rule-based. Uh, in the real world, when we are painting characters, complementary just means you are using colors that are somewhat opposite 
on the hue wheel. Let me grab the fence color picker, I'll make it bigger. There you go. So basically, if I take something around here in the blues, be it something a bit more aqua, like this, or uh, something a bit, you know, more blue, purple, uh, some more of an ocean blue. Well, everything that's kind of the opposite range is going to be complementary in that it's the, if you put both colors next to one another, sorry. If you put both colors uh, against one another, it's the highest color contrast you can get. But then it doesn't make the entire contrast for you, right? It's not enough to just pick, like, um, basically this tool. You can see that when I have a color right there, it takes a color with the same amount of lightness and saturation opposite on the wheel. And most of the time, that's not what you want. The way complementary color palettes work is most often you might have, for example, a, a very bright yellow in your composition. And as far as the blues are concerned, you might have something, you know, around that. Because in the real world, on a, um, a not overcast day, you know, when you have a blue sky, um, everything that's facing up yeah everything no everything that's facing down it depends um in the shadows you will have to you will tend to have more blue basically uh, but that might be you know a very desaturated blue like that so instead of the colors i have here a complementary palette might look like this where you have um an object that has a very strong for example yellow paint on top of it um some kind of prop in the background and then in the shadow you might have a very grayish color but that's slightly blue it varies a lot uh, but that's the the first tip i could give you about you know colors and color palette um let me think the tough thing is the um, very few uh, in order to make good color palettes the best thing you can do is probably either use color palettes from like not this one but start with for instance the pixel art 32 so use very restricted color palettes and try to paint with that because when you learn to paint the traditional way you know you're going to learn to build colors with the actual physical paint and the thing that makes it very difficult to find good palettes is the fact that we have millions of colors and we don't really want that so there's one tool you can use to restrict that in Krita. If you go to settings, dockers, you have the artistic color selector. Let me pull this one up. Dock you back. Okay. So the artistic color selector just limits the amount of tones you can choose from. You have the a foreground color at the top, the background color at the bottom in the background, and in the middle you have your wheel, your color picker. And um, in the preferences, you can choose the amount you know of light pieces, so basically the levels you can pick from. Then you can choose the number of Q pieces and the saturation rings. You know, with a limited set of colors like that it will help you to pick opposing colors and all hmm. oh there are a few posts here um is it possible to set keyboard shortcuts or ui buttons to jump between specific stabilizer settings nope no no this is not available this should be available as soon as the python is out basically because uh we should be able to customize the heck out of the program. Um, okay. And yeah, so as far as color selection, these are the first tips I can give you. And then um, artists will often give you tricks like basically if you're building a color palette, you start with a color like that. And when you want to make, so say you want to paint something that's orange, you start with that. And then when you want to add the shadows, 
you will lower the lightness and um, play with the saturation a little bit and then you will pull the hue as well and that's a trick that you use um, to create the shadow colors so if you want to create the next one you do the, the same thing again and um, you can kind of create monochromatic color palettes that work okay this works but the real world is obviously a lot more complex and if you want to make more realistic painting it's it's really going to be hard um, you have to study photos and more importantly go outside and try to paint outside um, yeah because it takes a lot of time to learn um, I can give you one extra tip when you want to transition between two opposing colors like these. Um, the easiest way to do it is to use gray in between. Um, the absence of colors is the way you transition between most colors most easily when you have to create some kind of gradation between them. So there you go. I, I hope that helps. Uh, aside from that, I do have a series on colors on the channel. It's a bit old, but uh, I think it should be relevant, hopefully. And getting back to the character stripes. Okay, so I told you I started with a uh, fairly desaturated tone. Now it's time to push it a bit because um, I feel confident with the design and it could use more saturation. When you're doing game art like that, so I, I do have some layers separated. Um, and this is kind of the first character I'm making for the project. I'm remaking it, okay, in a sense. So that's why I keep some body parts together. You know, it's just so that when I change a color somewhere, say I want the character to be uh, this tone, for example, well, I have to go back to every layer and fill it with that tone. So I don't want to have to do it too many times. So for the first or the first two sprites in a project, I just go ahead and uh, keep some things together so that it's faster to fill. As far as shadows are concerned, um, there are a few things we can do. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Kimi. Kimi, yes, yes, Kimi Chiron. Uh, there are a few things we can do. So we can either add you know, several layers of shadows, like this one. You can just duplicate the layer and work with the same color. You just add you know, a second level um, that's in particular interesting in particular if you're going to do if you're going to add details like fur and all because you, you'll need some uh, multiple several levels of shading in order to define those details or you can just do what most games do or anime and all they use one level of shadows and then they use outlines so outlines around the character's head and all that stuff. And that's what I'm going to do. Normally you do the outlines before, you know, you, you create the character's shape. So um, as usual, don't follow my lead, don't follow my example. Um, no, but in, in a case like this one, you know, it works fine if you just add the outline a bit later. It's not a big deal. Because um, the characters, when you're creating the characters at the start of a project, it might just, you know, work. You might just want to go with a different style that you than you anticipated. Um, for me, as I design courses, this is often the case. You know, I don't have, when I'm starting out, I have to experiment a lot. Uh, I have to do research and try to, f to, uh, also make tests to find the art style that's most um, rewarding and most interesting to teach to you guys. 
So that's why I focus on the character's form and shapes instead of uh, drawing line art, for example. Because in games, it's not that common to have the line art. Uh, how do you have a deal with shadows while well, characters have to be animated? Perhaps shadows should be animated too. Okay, so this depends a lot on what you are doing. This is a static asset for the moment. So I'm just, you know, painting the... Um, oops, I'm painting on the shadow layer again. So I'm just uh, tracing around the assets and all. If the character is animated, um, a character like this one that's quite cartoony and all, most of the time you will use cutout animation, in which case, no, you don't animate these shadows. Okay, in traditional animation, obviously you will go ahead and animate these shadows because you're going to redraw every frame anyway. But in case you're doing a um, cutout animation, so you have each body part on a separate layer or as a separate sprite, you won't do that because the whole point of this approach is to um, remove some work, you know, relieve some work from your shoulders. So you want to keep things as simple as possible. Um, so yeah, traditional animation, you're going to work a bit differently. I have a video on the topic on the channel about the animation process, where basically you will draw the rough frame one by one, just the character's outline, and then you will draw the shadow area not the shadows, right? The shadow area. So you will use lines just like I did when I defined the character's shadows here. You know, you, you draw... Can I draw that? You draw this line, for example, that defines the shadow area. And when it works in the animation, then, only then, you fill it. Well, my outlines are not very clean, but uh, this should be the trick. All right. Um, then, 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 continuing on with this character. Everything that's in the background in a game, you want to darken it to give your character some depth. It's not very realistic, but you, as the characters can be placed anywhere on the screen and at any level of depth in the environment, you generally want to do that. So um, to do so, I just used filter layers. You know, I uh, put the parts I want to darken in a group I'll just use a filter layer, maybe HSL adjustment will work best here. Seems fine. Okay. And I'll darken the asset and I'll do a bit of hue shifting as well. You can see me um, <clears throat> tweaking all three parameters, the hue, the saturation, the lightness. Also have to Put this back down in the group. And the way Krita works, by default, when you add filters inside of a group, they will only apply to that group. So they're pretty nice for compositing. Um, this is just a matter of, you know, the default blending mode it uses. So in Krita, that's normal. And in most image editing programs, Groups use the pass-through blending mode. I made a mistake. I do have some details that were all on the same layer. I have to grab them, paste them, and them up there. There we go. And still missing the spikes. Okay, something that's really cool in Krita, the isolation mode, which allows you to isolate a layer. 
that way you can see what's on it. Um, any more questions, by the way? Keep them coming, please. I don't know what to say today. My mind is my <clears throat> my mind is quite quite cloudy. So yeah, I'm really thankful if you can give me some uh, things to to answer in particular. Okay, I'm darkening the veil the same way and gonna use the same trick. So control shift G, create a clipping group, and I'll add some stripes to the tail. Not the right tone. Okay, and the good thing with using clipping groups and um, using the inherit alpha is that you can move the stripes, see where it's best to place them. The carrot has three of them. That's why I'm moving the first two to the right, just to accommodate for the third one. Have you ever tried Krita's animation? Yes, yes. Uh, I even have some videos on uh, the channel. It's really good. It's uh, it's really well designed. So um, you should um, be able to find a series about that on the channel. There's also uh, some tutorials in the Krita documentation, or some links to tutorials. So yeah, and uh, on my website. All right, only some outlines to add down there. Can you animate the stripes position? Um. If you're asking if we can animate like layer position in Krita, it's in the making. There's been a it's available in beta, but um, I don't really recommend it because it's not super duper um, you know polished. On the other hand, um, let me see if you're talking about you know another program like about not too many reasons to do that um but yeah basically if you're doing cutout animation you you animate what you cut things however you want the only issue you'll have with stripes and details like these is um in the game engine in the end you know i i'm making tutorials for game designers so thinking about game art you can't have that alpha clipping Okay, so you can't really animate the position of those stripes and all. If you want to do something like this, if you need something like this for some reason, you'd have to do it with a 3D program. And you'd have to animate the textures position on the mesh instead. So that's possible, definitely. Um, never used that, never seen that used either, but that's an option at least. Mm hmm. So what next? Uh, the original character Carrot doesn't have anything on his belly, and um, I've noticed that in most of the episodes, basically you can't really see his belly. Um, first of all, because he's a, a cat, you know, there's his uh, natural posture where you have the when he's sitting and all. He's not sitting too often, but. Um, that hides the, the belly a little bit. But on top of that, in most frames, he's basically... He's not a secondary character per se, but uh, because he's small and all, he's all, he's often at the bottom of the frame. So his belly is not too visible. I, I guess that's why 
you have these stripes you know on the head and the tail which are visible most of the time but not on the belly and so I still want to add something in there you know I don't want it to be empty let's do just that um, when you're making a game adapting it from an existing you know world or art direction depending on what you're doing, like for example, if you have a very strong fan base, you, you want to stay really true to the character's design. So really grab their essence. Um, having larger heads, I think it's not a problem. But things like what I'm doing for the belly, for example, that's something you don't really want to do. Because that's n just not part of the original character. Right now it's just because we're on the stream, I'm just telling you um, I prefer to have something in the body area so this could be um, I know I don't know some clothes or um, some chest uh, element like some fluffy you know fur in there current layer something like that just to add some more you know, variety to the character's body. Otherwise, it's a, it's a little plain. And maybe that works better than uh, the round belly. Oh, thanks, uh, Tom Gadraken. Okay, so no music is cool for you, actually. Because uh, I see everyone using music while they're streaming. To me, it's better if people can put their own music in the background instead of having the one I choose, you know. Um, ah, there's a question. Could you talk a little bit about your layout in Krita? Why do I have things that way? It's a bit different than the default one. First of all, uh, I have the toolbox, but it's quite small at the top. It's just because occasionally there are tools that are not available from you know with keyboard shortcuts that i might want to use be it for a tutorial for example the assistance if i were to do something uh, about that things like these but for the most part i don't use the toolbox okay hi there sean and then i have two things that are prominent the advanced color selector, which I often pull and just have on my canvas like that um, to pick colors because that's the thing I do most. And the brushes, so I can play with a variety of brushes. Not really useful on that stream, but I often switch between brushes quite a bit. Okay, then the other view in the top right corner so I can see a low resolution version of my character. I can see if the contrast and all is okay, the composition. Uh, the layers docker, quite prominent as well. Most of the time that's where I do most of the management and all. And then at the bottom, the tool options because they're necessary. That's where you set the smoothing options. But the one I use the most is um, the tool options for the um, transform box because that's where you have to go if you want to flip an asset. Oh, and one thing, when you're working on the character, don't forget to mirror it just to see if there's anything odd. Like, for example, the ears right there at the top. They're not working too great. And I should save before you know, there's a crash or something. Um, but yeah, so the method I've been showing since the, the start of the stream has one big defect. It's when you want to, you know, just transform or fix something. Um, because the shadow layer is its own thing at the top, if you want to transform stuff or use the liquify tool to fix stuff, you'll have to do it on all the layers at the same time. It's not always the best thing. Because you're going to um, downsample, you're, you're going to resample all the layers and it might be a bit slow as well because you're doing the transform on, on so many layers at the same time. You know, the character does need some things fixing in there. Uh, 
However, the ability to do that, to just go on the group and just use the liquify tool is really one of Krita's biggest strengths to me. It's it's a huge thing. Huge thing. I don't use the toolbox because I know the shortcuts by heart, basically. So uh, the main things I use is um, the brush, the multi-brush, so B. Shift B for me, I have some custom shortcuts. Um, v for the line. I don't like how the line works in Krita, but I use that. Then I have Q for the outline selection tool. It the, the, the letter doesn't make any sense, but I use Q because it's uh, under you know my left um, left hand. Uh, to get the tool options in the bottom right, so you need to have the tool options. You go to settings, Docker, tool options, and then you click and drag it. You have to drag the title bar and you can place it wherever you want. So Krita will tell you, you know, where it's going to get docked. And you want a blue area like that that's isolated and it's going to dock right there. All right, so having mirrored the character, um, you can see the shadow is a bit too strong in that area. So that's why it's very important using, you know, mirroring is a great way to see some of your mistakes when you're doing out like that. And also, I told you at the start of the stream that I don't like this method too much because, hey, can you, okay, fixed. Some problem with the icon. I don't like this method too much because I don't have full control over my shadow color. And uh, that's a thing with the multiply modes, you can only do so much. So that's something I'm not too fond of. Because the same, sh uh, the same shadow color gets applied uh, kind of uniformly. It's going to multiply everything. Okay, go back down on the tail and I just have the outline to add here. Even after your video about the color smudge brushes, I'm still having trouble with them. Aha, uh -huh. yeah, that's normal. That's, that's a matter of practice. <clears throat> no honesty, um, these types of brushes, you you have to practice quite a bit before you, you get the hang of them. Um, it's, and, and there are some limitations, you know, that are inherent to the way they work. Basically, the <clears throat> blending brushes, at least in my set, are going to be all the brushes with a, a pink brush stroke. And in the new version, it's going to be Pretty much everything with a pink outline. Those brushes, they... Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Those brushes blend paint on the canvas and um, they're a bit hard to control. Let me, let me see one second. Okay, let's um, look at them a little bit. So when you have a character with a cell shaded art style, something you might see often then is, you know, some softened shadows in there. So we're going to, to work on that a little bit. I'll add a new shadow layer. Done. Grab the color, delete. And there we go. I can show you one of those brushes. Um, okay. <clears throat> so these brushes have this property where if you don't press hard, they're going to smudge colors on the canvas. If you press hard, you're going to have thick paint, basically. The thing is, um, by default, if you don't have, you know, if you have trouble with your pen pressure, you, you really need to learn how to get to the very low levels of pressure to just subtly um you know push the shade a little bit but if you have trouble with that the trick is to lower the opacity 
and around 80%, something like that, the brush is going to get a lot softer. And these brushes are great because in very few strokes, you can get gradients like these. You, know, you can get non-uniform tones. Um, then, as far as, you know, when to use them, basically every time you want to have something that looks like paint, you want to use them and you want to practice a lot. Practice makes perfect, but more importantly, practice is what will allow you to use them. Um, that That's... That's the issue because, um, how can I say, um, in order to use those brushes well, you need to have a good understanding of how light and shadows work, first of all. Let me see, I'm gonna empty this one, uh, grab all the opaque pixels on this one, add a transparency mask, so that way I can paint freely inside of these, this shadow layer. So that's one way to work with them. Um, you can have a layer with a mask and then just paint freely inside of that layer with your blending brushes. That's a really cool way to add the shadows because you're going again to have gradients on them quite easily, quite naturally. Um, then as far as you know where to have that gradation, I'd say the thing is, um, the shadows are going to get lighter whenever there's some light hitting them, you know. So for the ears, for example, you can have them pretty dark and especially on the inside right there. Um, but then for the face, you might have some light coming from the right, right side of the screen. And in that case, because it's in multiply mode, I can brush back with white to remove the shade a little bit, you know. And I can use that to suggest that there's some bouncing light that's coming from the right side of the screen. You know, I can do the same for the bottom of the face as well. So I'm trying to paint subtly because um, these effects are not too strong, too strong, but yeah. That's the idea, that's how you use them. But if you look, uh, I was looking at how David Revoir uses them. And basically when he's brushing, say with a blender brush, like one of these, so these only bl blend paint on the canvas, they don't add any color. He brushes, he uses many, many strokes like this. Just brushes back and forth, up and down, left and right, to soften the effect um, slowly. A bit like what you would do with you know, real world material. I don't know if that helps, but you know, that's it. Yeah, sure, you can uh, change the Wacom pen settings as well. Hola, uh, many questions. Um, there's a questions about, question about applying filters to all layers. Uh, when you want to do compositing, so enhance the characters you know, colors and whatnot, but in a global way, not going back to every layer and painting on them, you can use filter layers. So the way they work, you have to go to the bottom of the layers docker, open it, add a filter layer. And basically everything that's below this layer is going to be affected by it. Now, uh, let's see, oh, this one, let me check. Yeah, so everything is in a group. So in Krita, by default, when you add a filter layer to a group, it will only affect the group. You can see it's not affecting the background, okay? Everything inside of the group below the filter layer gets affected by it. Now, as far as the filters you want to use, you know, I recommend everything in the address category. These are the basics. And um, the one I like the most is the color adjustment, but it's very hard for starters. It's the curves uh, thing. Uh, thanks for dropping by, Angel. It's the curves filter. And this one allows you to control basically every channel from your image. So if you use RGBA, you have the, let me check. Is this the input or the outputs? Um, okay. 
So on the bottom axis, you have the input colors, basically the input values from the RGBA combined channel. So basically it's, you know, on the left, you have the dark tones in your image and on the right, the white tones. And basically, if I pull, if I manage to do it, if I pull the bottom left point to the right, you can see it's changing the input slider. And this makes it so all the range that's, you know, um, below the curve on the bottom axis will get mapped to this uh, range. So starting from, you know, some mid gray up to white is going to be mapped. This mid gray will become black and um, the other tones will be stretched between black and white. Okay. That's the one I use most because um, basically with curves, when you create some kind of S, you add contrast. Okay. You darken the dark tones and you lighten the lighter tones. And you have really good control over that. So that's basically um, doing that is the equivalent of doing some kind of contrast filter. But the good thing is, if you do it on this main channel, the RGBA, it's going to um, add color contrast. You know, it's going to really saturate your piece. But if you go to the lightness channel and do that, you're just going to add darkness and brightness to the character, but the colors will kind of stay the same. Um, is there a difference with color picking a blend color on a separate layer above the base color layer compared to just blending it on the base color then layer picking, if that makes sense. Uh, not sure about the, the exact question. Hold on. Okay, it, it depends. It depends on your layer stack, as usual. Let me just. Okay, hey. So it depends on what you're doing. Uh, hold on, it, it's actually not looking that bad now. Looks better with um, a bit more, you know, a bit more contrast. Um, as far as picking the colors in, is concerned, yes, uh, picking it on the layer or you know on the canvas is different. When you control alt click, you're going to pick colors inside of the layer. So that is, uh, hold on. I can't have the mask in there. Okay. Okay. I can isolate another layer. Let me find one. Okay. So when you control alt click, it's like picking a color in isolation with only that layer isolated. And if you control click, you're going to pick a color on the canvas. Now, say I use a new layer in multiply mode. So let me paint with, hold on, I have to put it around the top. If your layer has a blending mode and you paint with a given color, um, okay. In multiply mode, if I pick this same color, you know, and I paint again, I'm not going to get the same results. And I pick the wrong brush for that. So if I pick the same color again, it's going to change because I'm not picking the layer that's the color that's inside of the layer. I'm picking the result of combining all the layers on the canvas. Yeah, control click picks on the canvas. It picks the colors that you see. So yeah, when you add a new layer, by default, it's in normal mode. So if you have one layer in normal mode, like you have the, uh, hold on, I'm going to do that. Does it work? Yeah. So I've created a new layer from my image. Basically, it's a single layer now. Um, if I paint inside of the layer like that directly with the normal blending mode, or if I add a new layer and I paint, it's the same thing because the normal mode just replaces the pixels on the layers below directly. But if you use other blending modes, no, it's not the same anymore.
is there a form to apply ethics pro gradient? Um, I don't know what you mean. There are vector shapes, but at the moment they're being remade. Uh, you'll have to wait until Krita 4 before you can really use them because it's not as good as it could be. If you want to use a vector drawing program with the ability to do strokes and all, I invite you to use something different like Inkscape. Um, okay, so as far as the demo is concerned, I think that's kind of done. Yeah, it's been more than one hour. Oh god. Um, so if you have any more questions, go ahead. And after that, I'm going to close the stream. I've got a bit more work to do. But uh, on Monday, this is um, this weekend and Monday are holidays in France. So normally there won't be anyone uh, in the office around. I can stream no problem because the internet connection is shared around here, a part of it. And if there are many people in the, the building, uh, my upload speed is a bit too low to, to stream in, a, in HD. And also I'll be in a better shape on Monday. Any idea of the intended uh, intended release date for Krita 4? Nope, nope, I didn't ask the developers. Um, one thing I can tell you is they said, basically they wanted to have before release releases every six weeks. And that created a lot of problems and the instability of the current version is due to that. So now they um, reverted, backed off, backed off from that. And, excuse me, they decided that they would only release new versions when they are ready. Um, is, there, is there a setting to adjust opacity with pen pressure? So, yes, there is, obviously, you can do that on your brush. But there's no uh, little toggle in the toolbar to do that globally like you have in Photoshop. If you want to do this, you have to go to the brush editor with your brush preset selected. And then you have to click on the opacity or flow parameter, enable pen settings, and then map the pressure to a curve like that. And this is the uh, Photoshop behavior, okay? This line going from the bottom left corner to the top right corner is how it works in Photoshop. In Photoshop, you don't have control over these curves, okay, um, you only have linear behaviors, but you know, in Krita you have more control, but on the other hand, it's more complex as well. So yeah, you can see now if I go from light to uh, light stroke to uh, full pressure, I get lower opacity in the uh, lower pressure range and then you know, full opacity when uh, I press hard. <clears throat> yeah, in France, we have cheap internet, actually. Uh, I only pay 30 euros a month. Um, but, you know, so it's two uh, or three times as cheap. Yeah, I, I know that in surrounding countries as well, it's quite expensive. For us, uh, we're, we're quite lucky in that regard. Um, my playlist at the beginning, I guess, Dan, you're talking about the music. This is, um, hold on, where is it? Life formed, fast fall, let me get that. The music was um, the Dust Force OST, a, a really nice uh, platform game. Well, there are plenty of good uh, platform games nowadays, but it was one of the first, you know, it was from the Braid, uh, Braid era one of the early indie platform games in uh, this generation or the, the past 10 years. Um. Oh, there's something I can show you for the end of the stream. So it's unrelated to the topic, but you know, so I'm going to put out a new brushes update. Oops, I shouldn't show you that. Uh, next trailer for Lazy Nezumi because um, I've been hired to do it. Hold on. I've done this. Uh, this is a script that generates the brushes you can see in Krita. So it's coming out uh, this month 
in at least in the premium version and as soon as I have time I'll do it for the free version as well. Um, so I have a tool to generate the brushes now. It's not perfect just yet but you know it works. Let me see this is everything I'm working on at the moment. <laughs> um, hold on this is my yeah my working di directory so you get a, a quick look at that. So basically I have um, a script that takes a few pictures like these. So you have the brush base, the outline, the pictogram, and the stroke. You can have any amount of, um, you know, any amount of layers and all you'd like to. And just with this simple script, grab PowerShell. So I'm going to delete that dist folder. Hold on. Okay, if I just go Python, generate the brushes, you know, this script just generates all the brushes from the Krita presets. You know, it takes those presets, the old ones, and it copies the parameters and it creates new images. You know, it layers them in automatically. And in a few seconds, it's just generated uh, 70 plus brushes. I have uh, a bit less than 100 in total, but in this version for now, I only have these. So if you're interested in something like this, tell me, uh, I'll put it up on GitHub. It's a bit technical, you know, as with uh, brush creation in general and Krita is quite technical, but if you'd like to do this for your brushes as well, you know, I'll, I'll share everything. Um. So, another question. You can export uh, animation and video. Yes, but you have to do some setup. So when you go to File, Render Animation, you can basically render the animation to an image sequence. But if you have FFmpeg installed, you can and uh, create a setup to use it, you can render it to a video. On Windows, you have to do it manually. Uh, the thing is, uh, they didn't put FFmpeg in there because on Linux it's installed for most people by default. Um, it's an encoding library that's used a lot in the Linux world. And um, yeah, on Windows you have to do it manually, I'm afraid. And you recommend using touch window tablets? Uh, yes, you want to use a tablet with pressure sensitivity. Yeah, that's good. Uh, now just saying touch is not supported in Krita, okay? Uh, I don't have a touch tablet here. It's the Cintiq 13-inch HD. God. It's the Cintiq 13-inch HD. But, 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 I do have a, a touch tablet at home that I use when I'm traveling. And um, you can't use it in Krita. Okay, um, as you can see, I'm, you know tired. Um, I don't know what I'm saying anymore, so it's time for me to cut the stream. I'll be back as soon as possible. I can stream on Monday, maybe. And, um, you know, I, I'm really busy at the moment. Um, may, may not look like it, but I'm working very hard. So, you know, I'll do, I'm doing my best to put out videos. The only thing I want you to know is next month, I'm doing a video tutorials, you know, video and text tutorials challenge for a Kickstarter. So there will be a lot more content. And thank you for joining me. Uh, thanks much. If you have suggestions for future streams and all, just leave it in the YouTube comments. Um, when you have a video and all, leave your ideas. Come on Discord. We have a Discord server where we chat and I log in there every day to, you know, there are people to help you and all. So you can see it right there. And okay. Um, let me grab the link. Okay. There you go. So please join the server and uh, message. You know, you can talk. There's a random section. You can showcase your work. There's a section for Krita and Godot. Um, we can talk about game design and all, so go ahead, you know, that's the place to have conversations, like it's better than on YouTube and all. 
Um, and, 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 and yeah, thank you for your patience, uh, you guys for, you know, um, supporting me, uh, GD quest and all. And, uh, yeah, uh, long live open source, I guess. How can we say that? Oh no, that's the typical ending is, um, you know, be creative, have fun and see you in the next stream, in the next video as soon as possible. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hold on. I'm saying that and actually I, yeah, okay. Now I can click. So see you soon.